Hey guys, my name is Judy Cho and I'm board certified in holistic nutrition. And I have a private practice where we focus on root cause healing. And that often starts with the carnivore cures, all meat elimination diet. Today, I have the pleasure of sitting down with Dr. Philip Ovedia. Why do we think that for heart health, we should stop eating cholesterol and saturated fats? Yeah, this is really a, uh, a complicated, convoluted story. And, you know, it's interesting when you really look at the scientific literature, there's no reason that we should believe that. There really is the evidence does not support that conclusion. And this has now been shown in multiple large, you know, what we call meta-analyses and, you know, interventional trials. And it was really just poor science, honestly, combined with almost a religious pursuit of this idea that got us here in the first place. Many people are probably familiar with the story of, you know, Ansel Keys, who was really the first scientist that strongly promoted this idea that saturated fat in the diet was was causing the epidemic of heart disease that we were seeing in this country in the 1950s. This really reached a crisis point in 1955 when President Eisenhower, while in office, had a heart attack. And that appropriately set off the alarm bells. And Ansel Keys, who was kind of a fledgling scientist at the time, you know, just really promoted this hypothesis about saturated fat and blamed, you know, President Eisenhower's heart disease on saturated fat, despite the fact that President Eisenhower was a heavy smoker. And that was sort of the obvious cause for his heart disease. And then, you know, he set off on a scientific mission to prove his hypothesis. And really, when you look at the work that he did, he didn't really stick well to the scientific method, we'll, we'll say. But he was able to gain a lot of political power and really, you know, use some sort of heavy handed techniques to quash any anyone who questioned his hypothesis. And, you know, from there, basically industry got involved, the food industry got involved, and then the pharmaceutical industry got involved. And, you know, when I went through medical school in the 1990s, you know, early to mid 1990s, it was an unquestioned fact. It was not presented to me as hypothesis. It was presented to me as fact as cholesterol is the cause of heart disease. And the primary way that we can manage heart disease is by managing cholesterol levels. And of course, you know, I and many others have now come to discover that that's not really the whole story. So if I went to medical school, to medical school today, would the same narrative be continued? So would they still say to me to reduce heart disease, I would have to reduce my cholesterol levels? Yeah, most definitely. And that's what all of our practice guidelines are centered on. And, you know, I want people to understand that it's not that I'm saying that cholesterol has nothing to do with heart disease. It's just that cholesterol shouldn't be our primary focus when it comes to heart disease. And a blanket lowering of cholesterol levels isn't really what we need. When I talk about cholesterol, it's in the context of our cholesterol quality matters. It's not really our cholesterol quantity that matters. The first thing that I think, you know, where my messaging might differ, and the first thing that I do differently in practice than much of the cardiology community is, you know, blood work is okay, and it gives us some indications, but it really doesn't tell us do you have heart disease or not? And so one thing that I emphasize to people is if you want to know if you have heart disease, let's get a test that actually looks at whether or not you have heart disease, not risk factors for heart disease. So the test that I advocate for strongly and use liberally with my patients is what's called a coronary artery calcium scan. And this is a type of imaging study, a type of CAT scan that actually looks at the arteries of the heart and looks for evidence of plaque in those arteries, specifically calcified plaque. So that's that's really step number one. And then, you know, the primary risk factor for heart disease from a dietary standpoint or, or sort of from a physiologic standpoint, I'll say, is 
insulin resistance. And so the main thing that I'm looking for is insulin resistance. And we can certainly get into why insulin resistance is so important, but study after study, really every study that I have ever looked at that compares insulin resistance to cholesterol levels in terms of their magnitude of risk for heart disease, it's not even close. Insulin resistance is five to 10 times more important, more powerful a predictor of heart disease risk than cholesterol levels are. If you have a non-zero score, the goal is you want that score not to get worse over time. And again, you know, cholesterol and a low fat, low cholesterol diet is not the answer. It doesn't work. We have plenty of data showing us this, but controlling insulin resistance is what you should be focused on. And the best way we have to control insulin resistance is a low carbohydrate dietary approach. And that includes a carnivore approach. And really, again, there's no reason that we should be fearing red meat or cholesterol in the diet. Red meat has now, again, clearly been shown not to be a risk factor for the development of heart disease. Red meat by itself, I'm going to say. Red meat as part of a Western diet has been implicated in heart disease and many other disease processes. But again, it's not the red meat itself. It's what people are eating with the red meat, the French fries, the soda, the toppings, the bun. That's the real problem. It's not, and it's never been the red meat itself. Insulin resistance, and there are a number of ways that you can look at that from a laboratory standpoint, is clearly associated with not only the presence of disease, but the progression of disease. And again, no matter what your score is might be today, if you stop it from getting worse, that's going to put you in a, you know, a better place. So, I look at various markers of insulin sensitivity. You know, you can start with if all you have is a basic lipid panel to look at, for instance, with which some patients are limited to for whatever reason, just look at your triglyceride to HDL ratio. And you want that to be less than 1.5. Anything over two for that ratio means that you're likely to be insulin resistant. Now, ideally, you're going to get better markers of insulin resistance. So this starts with a fasting insulin level. And if you have your fasting insulin and your fasting glucose level, you can calculate what's called the HOMA IR score. And you can, you know, there are numerous calculators online that you can just plug in your insulin and your glucose values. And again, it, you know, a HOMA IR score of greater than two is an indicator that you're insulin resistant. If you can take it to the next step, even better is what's called a lipoprotein insulin resistance score, LPIR score. And what this score does is it looks at the size of your cholesterol particles. And I mentioned earlier in the talk how important cholesterol quality is. And it turns out that insulin resistance is the primary in influencer of the quality of our cholesterol particles. So Dr. Bill Cromwell was really the one that pioneered this. And he was smart enough to figure out that you can work in reverse. You can look at the size of people's cholesterol particles and use that to determine if they are insulin resistant because that relationship is so strong. And so the LPIR score, I think, is the best practical way for us to measure insulin resistance. And I'll mention kind of what the gold standard way of diagnosing insulin resistance is. It's what's called a craft test, but it's kind of an impractical test to do. You basically have to drink a solution of sugar, of glucose, and then you have to measure both your insulin and your glucose levels every half hour for three hours afterwards to really, you know, figure out a craft, a proper craft test. So that becomes a little impractical to do. And I think today, if, you know, what the best lab test is for insulin resistance is the LPIR score. So what's so interesting is occasionally we will run a more comprehensive cholesterol panel that has the NMR graph with all the different size particles. Mm -hmm. And what we find is 
in that the LPIR is a little bit closer to more insulin resistant, but their fasting insulin is normal. So then we were always like, what does that mean? So it looks like you have the answer to that. Yeah. And really, you know, again, Dr. Kraft, Joseph Kraft figured this out because when you look at the Kraft patterns, so there are five patterns that you can get on a Kraft test. And, you know, two of the patterns that define insulin resistance, you actually start with a normal fasting insulin. So having a normal fasting insulin level doesn't guarantee that you're insulin resistant, that you're not insulin resistant. Now, if your fasting insulin level is elevated, that does show you that you're insulin resistant, but you can have a normal fasting insulin level and still be insulin resistant, you know, when you do a full craft test or now, like you said, the LPIR score will reveal that as well. Yeah. And that makes a lot of sense because we tend to see the fasting insulin because someone's carnivore, they've been eating this way for a while. So now their fasting insulin has come down and we were always perplexed with, well, that's interesting because their PIR score shows that they're still insulin resistant. So I guess that is more of a, maybe a better marker to look at long-term. Yeah, I think so. And, you know, again, you can then correlate this with things like visceral fat levels, which are, you know, very strongly associated with insulin resistance. And, you know, oftentimes I'm kind of putting all of these things together. You know, I always tell people, understand that there's no one test that tells you, am I healthy or not? And that's kind of the fallacy of the well, let's just look at your LDL cholesterol and that's going to tell us everything we need to know about heart disease. I mean, it really is nonsensical. You know, heart disease is such a complex process to think that one lab test is going to tell us everything we need to know. It it really was a, a, you know, just a silly concept to start with. Yet here we are. And most doctors firmly still believe that, you know, just look at the LDL cholesterol and you're going to be able to tell if someone's at risk of heart disease or not. Right. And it's so unfortunate because we see people turn carnivore. They're like, oh my gosh, all my symptoms are better. I'm sleeping through the night. I'm losing weight. I feel so much better. And then they go and do their blood work next to their total cholesterol or their LDL cholesterol. It says H and they're like, my doctor says I need to get on a statin now and I need to change my diet. And even though a lot of their symptoms have improved, Now they are so worried that they need to get on medication. I was just going to say that really is unfortunate. And especially people who have, you know, very strong reasons for, you know, needing to do a carnivore diet. You know, for instance, they have severe autoimmune conditions that are really being benefited by this dietary approach. And they're, they're basically scared out of it by their doctors who don't understand, you know, what this number means or doesn't mean. Yeah. So, you know, when we look at, you know, our blood cholesterol measurements, HDL, LDL are the ones that people are going to be familiar with. And, you know, we're told that HDL is good cholesterol and LDL is bad cholesterol. And again, that really, you know, that concept is very flawed. Both HDL and LDL represent families of cholesterol carrying particles in the bloodstream. And, you know, we can, one of the ways to sort of further break down our cholesterol particles is by their size. And specifically when we look at LDL cholesterol, this is most relevant for, we know that there are small, dense LDL particles and there are large, buoyant or large, fluffy LDL particles. And Furthermore, what we know is that it is only the small dense particles that end up in atherosclerotic plaques. The large, fluffy, large, buoyant particles do not get involved, incorporated into atherosclerotic plaques. So this is the problem with just looking at the LDL level as an overall level. We don't know, you know, is it high because you have a lot of large, fluffy particles which I would put forth is not a problematic situation. And even if your LDL level is what's considered low, you know, in the target range, if you have a low amount of LDL cholesterol, but most of that LDL is small, dense particles, you are still at risk of heart disease. And this is why I see people ending up on my operating table, despite the fact that they've had low 
you know, well-controlled in the guidelines, LDL cholesterol levels for decades in many cases, and yet they still end up with heart disease. They still end up on my operating table. Well, you know, I, I think that concept is flawed as well, honestly. And we're still really trying to figure out, you know, what APOE genetics mean. Um, you know, the biggest concern around them has been that APO, if you have what's called a double APOE4, that, you know, you're at increased risk for Alzheimer's disease, increased risk for heart disease. And that, you know, that's been, it, it's been put forth that you're in some way, you know, abnormally susceptible to saturated fat. But if we step back, it really doesn't make sense for that to be the case. Genetics don't really change quickly across a population. So APOE4 would have survived in the population at a time when humans were eating primarily saturated fat. Mm -hmm. Because for most of our existence as human beings, we ate primarily saturated fat. And so you know, I do have a number of patients that do have, you know, the double four, APOE4, and they're, they're doing these diets and we're monitoring them closely and they don't seem to be, you know, developing accelerated heart disease in my experience thus far. So I don't think, you know, it's really the whole story as we, you know, as we've told, been told that it is. Some people the adaptation to a carnivore diet might take a little bit of finesse. And, you know, some people, yeah, when they first try it, it doesn't exactly agree with them. And we might have to play around with things. But I'm really yet to find a person that, you know, for some reason couldn't do a carnivore diet or, you know, whatever conditions got worse on a carnivore diet. And, you know, I am always kind of a little cautious about this. I'm always on the lookout for it because, you know, I say to myself, you know, well, you know, it kind of sounds crazy. You know, every condition that people come to me with, you know, and they're like, well, can a carnivore diet help this? And I'm like, well, you know, it can't help everything. Right. But lo and behold, you know, I usually will get online and I'll go to some of the communities and I'll see what people are reporting. And most of the time you can find someone who says, yes, this got better on a carnivore diet. Uh, so my default these days is basically to tell people, you know, the only way we're going to really know if you're going to get better or not on a carnivore diet is to try a carnivore diet. And I'm also open and honest with people. And I say, most people don't need to be on a carnivore diet. I think there are certain conditions that, yes, you know, carnivore diet is very necessary. And these are a lot of the autoimmune conditions people with bad gut problems. You know, those are the people that I'm like, you need to be on a strict carnivore diet, at least for a while. Other people, I just want them to understand it's an option. And, you know, I say, let's give it a try. You know, give it 30 days, give it 60 days, see how you feel. And at that point, it's almost universal that if the person does it and they're able to adhere to it, they feel better after 30 or 60 days. And then it's like, do you want to stick with it? Do you not? Do you want to add back a few things selectively, which some of them do? And we do that carefully and they're okay with it, you know, so. Yeah, I love that. I mean, our practice uses carnivore as an elimination diet and for the same population that you're mentioning. And for some people, they have to go strict because they're trying to figure out is diet part of my inflammation. And so I think that totally makes sense. And then as you heal, if you want to add some other stuff back, in moderation, then maybe it's okay, but everyone's individualized. Yeah. So we have seen some cases where coronary artery calcium scores decrease. Okay. And yeah. that's very controversial to say, <laughs> but you know, I've seen it <laughs> is all I can say. Okay. And there's always question, you know, understand that if you get two coronary artery calcium scans, even if you get them done on the same machine, you know, one right after each other, there's, there's variance, you know, like there is in every measurement. And so five, 10% variance, you could probably chalk up to, you know, just a difference in technique. Uh, but I've seen people now that, you know, have 15, 20% lowering of their CAC score. I don't see people go from a thousand to zero, but I think you can lower this some. More important though, is just stop it from getting worse. Again, we have a lot of data to show that, you know, when you look at serial coronary artery calcium scanning over time, 
the average progression is about 15 to 20 percent per year. Wow. And we have data that if your score goes up by less than that, if it doesn't progress that quickly, that no matter what your absolute score is, it puts you into a lower risk category. So, you know, the way that I utilize coronary artery calcium scanning in my practice is most of my patients, you know, we get their kind of baseline scan when they come into the practice. And then we get a scan a year later. And what we're looking for is that that score hasn't gone up. And like I said, we've seen a few cases where it's gone down. And for the most part, if they've address their insulin resistance, if they've been able to reverse their insulin resistance, if we eliminate other sources of inflammation, we see that the score doesn't progress. Maybe their their blood sugar in the morning is about 100. Would you be yeah. worried about that? Usually not. You know, I think this is a common thing that I see as well in my practice. And, and there are some things that you can do you know, playing around with kind of fat to protein ratios and, you know, fasting windows and stuff like that can help bring down the glucose. But generally, you know, if everything else looks good and, you know, usually with those people, again, I'm very liberal about using continuous glucose monitors. So, you know, if your blood sugar is kind of a flat, you know, hundred ish throughout the day, I don't think that's something we need to be too worried about, but, you know, I want to make sure that they're not, you know, again, check the LPIR score, and then we're going to follow that coronary artery calcium score over time. Even if you have a zero score, I still want to make sure that you're staying zero. And maybe in that situation, we may not check it every year. You know, maybe you go two or three years. A lot of it's going to depend on the age of the patient and, you know, again, what these other markers look like. Because even if you have a zero score, if, you know, you are insulin resistant. If your LPIR score is abnormal, you have other, you know, features of insulin resistance, then, you know, I am worried about that person. And the zero score still doesn't really reassure me because we can be fairly certain in that scenario, it's not going to stay zero. Yeah. So my general guidelines is, you know, men should probably get their first scan around the time that they're 40 and women probably around the time that you're 50. If you have, you know, reason to be concerned, you have a strong family history, if you know you're insulin resistant, if you've been a smoker, something like that, then get the scan earlier. It's really never too early to get the scan. It's just a matter of the zero score. You know, the younger you are, the less significant having a zero score ends up being. So, you know, yes, I've had some people that are in their 20s and 30s and were worried for some reason and we get a scan. Understand that as a heart surgeon, I now operate on 30 year olds like they end up on my table with advanced coronary disease. So it, it's certainly possible, you know, that you have heart disease in your 20s and 30s. And the earlier we find out about it, and this is the other part of this to understand, if you're young and you have a non-zero score, even if that score is very low, like five or 10, that's a major, major red flag. Because if you're 20 or 30 years old and you've already started forming plaque, we have a big problem that we need to get a, on top of before you know you end up as one of those 30 or 40 year olds on my operating table. I mean, all, all of the above certainly contributes, but I think diet is still first and foremost. And these are people who, you know, likely have been insulin resistant from a very young age. And again, we're seeing this. We're seeing teenagers and even pre-teenagers diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, you know, not type 1 diabetes, type 2 diabetes, which means that they've been insulin resistant from very early on. And we know, for instance, that, you know, if your mother is insulin resistant while you're in the womb, that's going to make you more prone to being insulin resistant. And, you know, some of these, you know, some of these children, unfortunately, that are born under those circumstances, and then they're really fed sugar from birth. And a lot of the things that kids get fed these days are just, you know, very high sugar and they get insulin resistant very young. And these, I think, are the 30-year-olds that are, you know, now ending up on my operating table. Insulin resistance, it turns out, is a 
underlying, you know, risk factor root cause of sleep apnea, as well as periodontal disease. You know, a few weeks ago, I actually was talking to a conference of periodontists and, you know, went through all of the literature about the associations between periodontal disease and heart disease. And it turns out that, you know, insulin resistance is a common root cause there. Uh, most people with periodontal disease are insulin resistant, and therefore they're also at risk for heart disease. Now, there've been some other theories about, you know, the periodontal disease introducing bacteria into our bloodstream, which then causes inflammation that damages the blood vessels. And there's probably some validity to that as well. The, the kind of scientific evidence to support that is that when they look at atherosclerotic plaques, oftentimes there are bacteria in them. And many of the times those bacteria are the same bacteria that we see in the mouth. So that may be playing a role as well. When we look at sleep apnea, again, sleep apnea is strongly associated with insulin resistance and may be an indicator of insulin resistance. But sleep apnea is also going to be putting extra stress on your heart. You know, basically every time you stop breathing, you know, during the night when you have sleep apnea, that's going to cause usually your blood pressure to go up, your pulse rate to go up. It's going to be putting uh, physiologic stress on the heart, which can contribute to the development of atherosclerosis as well. If you have high cholesterol, high LDL cholesterol, and you're insulin resistant, that's a problem. Because again, it's very likely in that scenario that you're going to have the poor quality of the small, dense LDL cholesterol. So if you're not going to do something about the insulin resistance, then yeah, take a statin. It's going to give you a little benefit. And people need to understand that that benefit is very little. It's nowhere near the big numbers that are thrown out there, 30%, you know, 50% reduction in disease. Those are, you know, that is statistical manipulation where they use something called the relative risk reduction instead of the absolute risk reduction. So when you look at the absolute risk reduction, the true reduction in risk, the numbers are more like three or 4%, which of course sound nowhere near as impressive. And the flip side of that is, you know, if you're taking these medications for decades, you're exposing yourself to the negative effects of these medications. And one of the most prominent negative effects of taking statins over the long term is that it increases your risk of becoming insulin resistant. It increases your risk of developing type 2 diabetes. And since these are primary drivers of heart disease, this is why I think the overall you know, data on statins is so disappointing, because maybe it's you know, lowering your cholesterol level a little bit, but if, at the same time, it's making you more insulin resistant. It, it really may be increasing your risk of heart disease, you know, as a net effect. Um, so, you know, there are perhaps some other scenarios, but, you know, again, I have the conversation with patients about insulin resistance. Let's address that. And once you're no longer insulin resistant, we've really never shown any benefit to taking these medications, you know, in that circumstance. And so put yourself in a position where the medication is certainly is simply not going to be a benefit for you. And I think that's the best answer. But if you're not going to do that, then yeah, there may be some benefit to taking these medications. Yeah. You know, I think the unfortunate thing from a practitioner standpoint is, you know, practitioners have been put in the position of thinking, of believing that the only way that they can help patients, you know, mitigate heart disease risk is by prescribing these medications. And, and again, nothing could be further from the truth. You know, low carbohydrate diets addressing insulin resistance, you know, are much more powerful ways that we can help people. But most practitioners don't know that you know, they're not aware of it. And it's not that they're withholding information from patients. It's they're truly not aware of it. And like I said, the only thing I heard in medical school and the first half of my career as a heart surgeon was, you know, just lower the patient's cholesterol. And that's the way that we can deal with heart disease.